excited to be speaking to you this morning. It's been a little while since I've been up on this stage to be able to bless you with God's Word. Um, many of you may, may know me, obviously. Some of you may not. Um, the past 10 months have been really tough on myself and my family, but God has been so faithful in it. And if you don't know, my wife this past February got a double lung transplant, and it was a big deal. And, uh, and we thought that maybe she, this was something that would happen in her life later on. She struggles with a genetic illness. Uh, she's battled since birth. And, uh, and the last 10 months were real difficult. She was on oxygen 24-7. She would have sleepless nights, and I would have sleepless nights just trying to be there for my wife. But praise God that we got the call, and this past week we celebrated five months that she's had her new lung. Isn't that incredible? And um, listen, I just I want to thank you for your prayers and for your support. And I, and I really want to just say this with everything that's in me, that without Grace Fellowship, without this church, without the pastors and the leaders and you all, I don't know if you would have made it through the same way. So I want to thank you for that, and I wanted to mention that. And, and I'm just thankful that I'm here, and I get to speak because I love speaking, and I love just going through God's Word and seeing what He has to say to us. And we've been going through this series, Walk This Way. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And right there in your notes, we're going to go through Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And this is what it says as we start out this morning. It says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and this morning we're going to talk about kindness. And if you were here last week, we talked about patience and that when it comes down to learning biblical patience, the best way to learn that is under pressure. And that sometimes we need to really be patient towards that other person, even if they may not be that patient and it's not an easy thing to do. Now, as I was prepping for this morning... I was thinking about the way that people connect to things and, and working with students. You know, students connect with things in different ways. Students can sometimes, and even you as well, you connect with maybe music. Some people connect by reading. Maybe you connect the most in small talk and with people. Growing up, and even still today, I connect the most with movies. That's just the way that I connect. I remember growing up watching movies with, dad, with my dad, and that was some of the most memorable times in my life. So as I was thinking about kindness and maybe some movies that exemplified some great kindness... It was pretty obvious that the best movie that I could think of was The Addams Family. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen these movies, or if, this is a, a picture of them, and, and this is part two. They came out, I think, in 1993 when I was younger. And, um, and here's the next photo, and this is one person that's really known on the show is Wednesday. This is her when she was in that black and white TV show, because this has been around for a while and, until they made it into movies. And there she is in the movies. And in part two, in Adam's Family Values, we see that uh, Wednesday goes to this camp. And if you know the Adams Family, <clears throat> or maybe you don't, they're a little kooky, right? And they're not really like everyone else. And they act a little different, and it's dark, and, and all these different things. But, and, and Wednesday specifically. But when she goes to this camp, something happens where this group of people and counselors and this girl who doesn't really like her in the photo on the left that starts trying to really bring her in, and they start singing this song, this kumbaya song, and all of a sudden they zoom in to Wednesday, and it seems like she's getting it, and a light comes on, and she's like, I'm about to start being kind now, and I don't know if you remember this movie. It seems like, wow, she's getting it, but in Adam's family fashion, what happens? She burns the place down, all right? She just pretends, and she just, it's just a mess. And I say that because sometimes when we talk about kindness, it's hard to be kind to so many people. Is it not? Like, it's hard for us to be kind. It's hard sometimes when we see people pretending to be kind. I think that's pretty obvious when we see that, and they're not genuine. So some people can really fake it. And have you ever been around people like that, that are unpleasant? And everything seems to be going well. You give them good news, and they give you bad news times five. And they're just always down, and you don't want to be around them. Don't look at your neighbor or your spouse or your kids, okay? They're a blessing. That's what God told me in his word. <laughs> right? So you know what that's like. Now think about this. Think about this. Who is the kindest person that you have ever met? Think about it right now. Who is the kindest person? Is it maybe mom? Is mom the kindest person that you've ever met? How about dad? Raise your hand if dad was the kindest person. I didn't think so, right? Dad's like rugged, 
mow the lawn, where are you going, I'm sleeping, right, and that's okay. But maybe, maybe it is dad, right, or maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's a friend, maybe somebody who's been there for you throughout your life, no matter what. See, for me, as I was thinking through this, I could only think of people that I have heard of that are kind. And when I went to answer who's the kindest person that I have ever met, I came up with nothing. That's sad. Right? So I thought of it another way. And here's a question for you. Maybe that's you, and that's okay. We're in this together. Fist bump me later. Um, imagine the kindest or nicest place that you've ever been to. All right? A place that when you go, you know it's going to be lovely. So think about that right now and tell me if the first thing that comes to your mind is the DMV. Those, I mean, they should open more. Right? Is it the DMV? You just love these places. Maybe not the DMV. How about for you, Disney in December? You're just thinking, I can't wait to bring the kids. That is life training. All right? How many of you are thinking the holidays with the family? Pleasant. Reunions. Or how about the ER? How many of you are thinking, no, we don't think of any of these Examples. Here's the first one you thought of, and I know you did because it's Sunday, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and they're closed. Right? When you go up to Chick-fil-A and you go up to that window, they're going to be kind and they're going to be nice. And when you order your food, you know it's going to be fresh and it wasn't sitting under a lamp for an hour. When you go up to that window, they're going to give you your food. You're going to say thank you. And what are they going to say? My pleasure. My pleasure. Right? And you take that food and you're always like, I would have paid more. Wow. Right? It's, that's just how Chick-fil-A makes us feel. Because everybody in there is kind, even though they're getting paid to do it. How many of you are thinking being at home when the kids are gone? Right? Or when it's just you. And you're just at home and you finally have some peace and quiet. Ladies, how about getting pampered? Right? You go somewhere and you're like, finally, this is the place. Maybe it's Starbucks. Guys, maybe for you it's fishing, or maybe it's being at home but napping after eating a piece of ribeye, and you're alone. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. <laughs> Listen, we want people to be kind to us, right? I want people to be kind to me, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. And here's why. Because sometimes when we're kind to people, it backfires. Sometimes when we're kind to people, we know we're being vulnerable, and it may be that they don't want to be kind back because they're not feeling that generous, and they're not feeling like they need to be kind at that moment because something is going on in their lives. And yet in the Bible, we see that this is the way that God has responded to us since the beginning of time. Think about just a simple example like Adam and Eve in the garden, and God gave them everything, and they lived in perfection, and they had this relationship with God that we'll never really understand until we're in heaven with him. And he said, you can eat of anything, and you can be with me in this amazing relationship. Just don't touch that one tree. It's just that one. But they do. And God is re still responds to them, and he tries to have them tell the truth and to open up, and they still lie. And God, instead of immediately killing them and saying, you did what I told you not to do, he doesn't just give them consequences, but he shows them mercy and kindness. And we see other examples. For example, in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, if you want to write that down in your notes, it states that God's kindness and patience leads us to repentance. In Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, it says, The goodness and loving kindness appeared through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And right there in your notes, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses, verse 32, it says, Be what? Kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I got back from Jacksonville, where my wife was at, where she got her lungs First thing that I was thinking of doing was laying in my own bed, just being comfortable, right? That's just, that's just being honest. The first thing she told me that first week back is, listen, how can we help people that are struggling and that are hurting in West Palm? And that's just so convicting, right, because I'm a pastor, and, and my wife's the one telling me this, right? Um, and this is just, it's so important to, to her, and this is why, not just because this is how God made her to be, but... Early on in our relationship, and even a little bit before that, 
uh, before we were dating, we used to go out and feed homeless people in downtown Miami. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to downtown Miami. Anytime after 12 or 1 o'clock where, you know, you'll have the American Airlines Arena and all these other great places. But once it gets really late at night, hundreds of people come out from I don't know where, and they're on the streets. And they're living on the streets. I mean, to the point where I remember, like it was yesterday, when I have gone out and I have seen families. I mean families as in mom, dad, young kids, baby, grandparents. That is a sad, heartbreaking thing to see. So we used to go out, and obviously we wanted to tell them about the gospel, but we also wanted to fill a physical need. So what we would do is, knowing that we didn't have a lot of money and we would take a whole bunch of people with, with us, we'd make the cheapest and yet most delicious thing that you can think of. Not Chick-fil-A sandwiches. PB&Js, exactly. Peanut butter students know because they live on it in college, right? PB&J san- or ramen. PB&J sandwiches. So we would go out and we would give these sandwiches out. And I'm not kidding. We'd make two or 300 sandwiches and they would go in an hour. Gone. Just that's how many people were out there. So when we got back, my wife said, hey, can we make some care packages? We'll put them in a Ziploc. I mean like toiletries and food and a track and all these different things. And can we give them to anyone that we may see on the streets? And I said, sure, absolutely. So we'll keep one in the car. We keep one in the house. And it just so happens that we started doing this together. Well, we'll walk at night during the week. And, and we were walking. And, and, and naturally, we didn't have one on us. And we were like eight blocks away from the house. And my wife sees this young lady, in her, probably in her 20s, late teens. And you can clearly see that she's homeless. And my wife told me, listen, run home, get the care package. And I said, honey, we're walking. We're walking, it's me and you, and okay, I'll run. And I ran home, and I got the care package, and that's just my wife's heart, and I did it. And then I was excited, and I came back with the package, and my wife's already initiated the conversation with her. And one of the things that I won't forget is not just the way that she received that care package, but when we saw her walking, and actually, and I've done this too, you know, we'll see people that are struggling or maybe on the streets, and we'll kind of just walk by them. And people were just walking by this girl, just ignoring her. But when my wife initiated, I saw her before my wife initiated the conversation. When my wife initiated the conversation, she just changed. You could tell that some of that shame was falling, that somebody actually took the time to talk to her. And then when I gave her the package, she was just so taken back by that. That somebody took the time to care and say, hey, you're not ignored. That hey, if you don't have a meal tonight, here's a meal. And that's just so incredible that that simple act of kindness, I believe, changed her night. And maybe her perspective for anyone who calls himself a Christian or maybe her perspective on God. As we continue through this series and we walk out our faith together and we study the fruit of the Spirit, I want you to remember that the fruit of the Spirit is an outward expression of Christ dwelling within believers. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. I want you to understand that the Spirit is the daily sustaining, inspiring, and guiding power of God within us. And right there in your notes, and this is huge, the Spirit replaces the desires of the flesh. And that's vital. Because before you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we don't know any better in a sense, but we realize that we're living in a way that's not the way it should be. We look around in the world and we know that there's brokenness. We look around and we know that people are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. We look at our own families and we see things happening that we wish were different. We pray for things to be different. And that's true in my own life. But through Jesus Christ, we see here that Paul tells us that that desire, those desires of the flesh, are replaced through the Spirit. And God's Spirit helps us overcome this lifestyle opposed to him. And that's why in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, it says this, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you have your Bible or your Bible app right there in your notes. We're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And what I want to do is I want to look at this incredible story of kindness this morning. This ultimate act of kindness that was unheard of in biblical times then and even today may shock us as to how far this well-known king named David went to bless another person. This story is about love and compassion and forgiveness, hope. And so much kindness. Now, the term kindness doesn't really come up when you think about King David. Yeah, King David was that young boy who killed Goliath and went against the enemies of God. 
Yes, King David was a great warrior. He, he was a man that came before God and did what was right before God. We see him in, the, in Hebrews 11 in the, the, the Faith Hall of Fame. He's mentioned in there. And yes, he's also the same one who committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her innocent husband killed because of it. And he also wasn't the greatest father as well. But one thing that separated David from so many other people then and so many kings and examples that, we, that we've had in that time frame and even today is that David was always willing, when he was called out on something by either the, Nathan, the, the prophet Nathan or anyone else, he was willing to say, I messed up and I repent. And I'm going to turn to you, God, because I should not have done this. David does that time and time and time again because the Bible tells us, rightfully so, that he's a man after God's own heart. He was willing to turn back to God regardless that he's king or not. He's willing to repent. So we're in 2 Samuel, and we're going to start in verse 1. Listen to what it says here. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there, still, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. This is really important here if you want to underline it. He is crippled in his feet. First point this morning as we go through the passage is this, that true kindness requires selfless action. True kindness requires selfless action. David had good reasons not to show kindness to this descendant that we're going to learn about. If you didn't know, before he was king, King David, there was a king before him named King Saul. And King Saul, at the time, the first king of Israel, was jealous of David. And he saw that David was having more success. And more than that, while David was seeking God and everything that he did, it seemed that King Saul was moving further and further away from God for different reasons. But what we know for sure is this, that while King Saul moved away from God and King David continued to move closer to God, it seemed that David was always willing to forgive and be kind. And King Saul, he wanted nothing more than for David to be dead. And he attempted to kill David a few times, even though he failed. And more than that, even King David, when he was on the run, had a few opportunities where he could have killed Saul. And he spared him because in David's heart and in David's mind, when he looked at this king, he didn't see someone who wanted to kill him. He saw God's anointed. He saw the king of Israel. He saw the one that God appointed to lead the people. Big difference. In the ancient world, another thing that's unheard of that we're going to see in the story is that you didn't spare family or someone that was, that, that was not part of your lineage when you took over the throne. So we're going to see that this person was not part of David's family. He was part of Saul and Jonathan's family. And the expectation was that when a new king comes into power that's not part of that family, they get wiped out. That's just the way it was. Get them out of the way so that they're not a, a bother or a problem to the kingship, to the kingdom. But there was a descendant that was still alive, and we're going to see that that's not what David is going to do. But I want you now to think about this descendant we're going to learn about. Put yourself in his shoes. He's a descendant of Jonathan. We already learned at the end of verse 3 that he's lame and crippled. So that means that he needs someone to care for him. He's not part of David's lineage. So the expectation was when he calls its descendant that death would probably be inevitable or maybe at the very least exile. How does a person defend themselves from a ruler if they're lame and dependent and vulnerable? What does this person do when they're called before someone like this? How anxious and scared could this person have felt once they hear the news that the king wants to see you? And yet David wants to show kindness to one of Jonathan's descendants. Why? Why does David want to show this kindness? I'm going to give you two reasons why. The first is right there in verse 1. David says that he wants to show this kindness for the sake of Jonathan. Now, King Saul, even though he was evil before David and wanted him to just be wiped out, King Saul had a son named Jonathan, and where Saul hated David, 
The Bible tells us that Jonathan and David had a relationship closer than brothers. That they were very close and they were there for each other. And Jonathan knew that as he continued to follow his father and to battle and different things, that his father's heart was getting further from God, that he didn't want anything to happen to David, so he would at times protect David and tell David things and protect him as much as he could. But towards the end, we see in 1 Samuel chapter 20 that he goes to David, and Jonathan knows that inevitably David will be king. He knows where David's at in his heart. So he goes to David, and this is what he says to him in 1 Samuel chapter 20. He basically says, David, show me the love of the Lord. And in that, please do not cut off my family. Do not wipe out my family line when you take the kingdom one day. That's what he asks of David. Don't cut my house off forever. And knowing that, when we look at this passage, we see the word kindness. What does that word kindness mean? Mean when the Hebrew, the word has said, literally means loyal obligation. So think about that promise that was made, and maybe the misunderstandings or the, uh, the, the maybe the definition that we have about kindness, and how the Hebrew passage and what David is doing here tells us that kindness should be. Eventually, Jonathan and Saul will die in battle, and David took the throne. And even though this promise was made. David is in, under no obligation to fulfill this promise. Like, he really doesn't have to. He's the king. He doesn't have to give anyone anything that doesn't have to do with his own family. And he doesn't really have to fulfill this, even though he made that promise. But I want you to understand that David's heart is not like that when it comes down to Jonathan. And he wants to be loyal to his one and greatest friend who's now gone, who he mourned. And he's under an obligation that he wants to fulfill in this story, David had nothing to gain from this act of kindness. If anything, he probably had more to lose. But he's going to go forward, and he's going to act, and he's going he's to keep his word. And we're going to keep reading in verse 4. It says this, the king said to him, where is he? Where is this descendant? And Ziba said to the king, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, if you're thinking about a, son na- a son's name that you want to name him, here it is. <laughs> Mephibosheth, say that ten times. The son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. I want to start by looking at where is Mephibosheth from. The word there that they give us is from the land of Lodabar. Let me tell you what that means. That term Lodabar, where he's from, that's outside of Jerusalem, it literally means nothingness. He's from nothingness. Another translation says, or, or definition is he's from lacking. From nothingness, from lacking. Think about it. He lost his father. He lost his dad, right? He lost his dad. He lost his grandfather. He's crippled. And we're going to learn learn more how that happened later on. He's lame. He's falling before the king here, about to wait to see what's going to happen. And we're going to see that he has this posture of humility and nothing to offer. He's nervous. The emotions are going through. Is he going to kill me? Is he going to kill my family? What's going to happen? Verse 7, David said to him, I love these three words, and God shows us this through his angels and other ways in the Bible, when we don't know what's going on and we're afraid, he says, do not fear. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. See how he viewed himself? From the land of nothing, having nothing, and he's not even as good as a dead dog out in the streets. And I love that David doesn't focus on that, and he just blows his mind away, and he says this, Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and all of his house I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. 
But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at, the, at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Mika. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. And that reminds us again, in case we forgot, now he was lame in both his feet. Second point in your notes is this. Kindness, true kindness, is supernatural. True kindness is supernatural. David does two things here in the passage that are clear. The first thing that David does is he gives him back land. And he gives him back that need, that provision that we all need, right? He's going to give him land. It's not like today, yes, where we can go out and get food anywhere we want. Back then they had to till their own land and, and grow their own food. And now he's from a land of nothingness. And David is saying, I'm going to give you back what's rightfully yours. Understand, he's not really giving him back anything that's his. This is David's. David is taken away from himself. And he's going to give it to Mephibosheth. But David... Showing this ultimate act of kindness in this story. He doesn't stop there. Another thing that David does in this passage is that he gives Mephibosheth a new identity. He tells Mephibosheth once again, he reminds him in this passage that you have worth and that you have value. Think about it. Mephibosheth, at one point, he goes from being a future king to being a fugitive. He goes... From being in a position of strength and now he's weak. And by the way, in case you're wondering, why is the passage telling us that he's lame so much? What happened? Was he born that way? He wasn't. What happened was when he lost his father and grandfather, naturally being in a royal family, he had a caretaker. And when the enemies of God were coming in and Jonathan and Saul died, his caretaker picked them up and they fled. And in the process of fleeing, she dropped them. Or he, whoever it was, dropped him. And he became paralyzed at that moment. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Imagine that. You're going from one day being king, and now all of a sudden your life changes. You're on the, you're on the run, and now you're paralyzed. You're lame. You're crippled in both of your feet. That's how quickly someone's life can change in a moment whether it's something that you did that you didn't want to do or maybe you didn't realize or somebody, something somebody else did. And your life changes in that second. A loved one gets sick, been there. You lose a job, been there. Someone dies, been there. The end of a relationship stings in some way, shape, or form. David isn't in this act. He gives him back worth. He tells him that you're going to have community, that you're no longer an outcast. He bestows on him something that's reserved for royalty. And not only does he give him back his identity, not only does he give him back land that we see in verses 9 and 10, but did you notice where he's going to be eating his meals? At the king's table like he's one of his sons. Man, that's incredible. That is just so powerful. There's a reason that David is a man after God's own heart. And it's because David performs the unexpected and he goes above and beyond. I want you to see, this is why David did it. David didn't do it because he had so much. David didn't do it because he felt like he had to, because that's just, he's the king and why not? No, David does this. It tells us in verse 3, That he wants to bless Mephibosheth because he wants to show God's kindness. That regardless if he's king or not, God has been faithful to him. And in that, he's going to be faithful with what he's been given. And he's going to bless someone who may not deserve it, but he's going to do it anyways. And he's going to show this act of kindness for the sake of his friend and for this family that was once from a place of nothingness and now has more than they ever thought they would. See, David in this passage is a reflection of the character of God. It reveals God's 
heart for each and every single person in the world. It shows us that God knows our condition. He knows that we can't fix ourselves. He recognizes that, and he responded. He's responded. He's still responding today, back in the garden and even after. And when he went and he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send my son to the cross so he can die and undo death. And when death is no longer there and it's no longer a sting, people will come back and they'll have a heart for me. And I'm going to show this kindness through Jesus Christ. Everything changed when Jesus went to the cross. Listen, like Mephibosheth, for so many of you in the room that call yourself followers of Christ, you and I were once without hope and without God. We were. The question that I want to ask as we, as we close this morning is this, what's our response? What's your response when you Look at this story, because listen, Mephibosheth, he didn't enter the king's court and demand things. He didn't enter the king's court and give excuses and talk about what happened to his past. He didn't enter the king's court and act as if he deserved anything. No, what he did was he went in and he fell on his feet and prostrated himself and had nothing, and he was ready to serve, even being lame as well. Like Mephibosheth and his physical condition, every single person in this room has this spiritual condition where we're crippled. We're crippled, and we want relationships to go right, and we need restoration. We know there's something wrong in the world. There's this void. And like Mephibosheth from the land of Lodabar, what happens is when King Jesus comes into your life. He takes something that seems irreversible and hopeless in your situation and he switches it. And he does something in you that you never thought and if you allow this to happen, and that's my challenge to you, if you accept and come to that point where you receive that act of ultimate kindness, this beautiful redemptive story will begin in your life. For you that are believers in the room, remember your calling Right, to keep the faith, to speak love, right? to speak truth in love, and remember more than anything that eternity is at stake for so many people around us. 